Welcome everyone. Washington Walks webinar Wednesday. Happy to have you once again. This is our third to the last offering for June. We'll have another webinar next week. I'm hoping about race riots that occurred in Washington in 1919. Same time period as today's webinar, but this time we're focused in Washington, D.C. Um, and then the last one we'll do will be on July 1, and it's going to be with my colleague Garrett Peck, who's going to talk about the very first brewer to work in the District of Columbia and in the era when Alexandria was part of the District of Columbia. There'll be information coming via email about those two webinars, and we'll also get them on our website. We're gonna, heads up, we're gonna take a break for July, a little rest, and then we'll come back in August through the end of the calendar year. Today, we're gonna be all about what you don't know about Senator and President newspaper man Warren Harding. And how this webinar came about, not that Warren Harding isn't an interesting and valuable person to talk about at any time, but Washington Walks gives a regular walking tour of a neighborhood here called Calorama, which happens to be where five men, well now six, if you count President Obama, but five men who were or became the US president lived either before or after they were in office. And one of those is Warren Harding. So the house he lived in when he was Senator Harding in Calorama is a stop on our walking tour. And I'm one of the guides that gives that walking tour along with my colleague, Cheryl. And my colleague who's here today, David Kaplan, he probably feels a little envious because he would love to give this tour because he has an abiding passion and interest in presidential history and in Warren Harding. So he's gonna join today along with a really special guest, Sherry Hall, who is with us from Marion, Ohio, the hometown of Warren Harding. She's the site manager of the Harding Home Presidential Site. They're having a big celebration this week of this year for the uh, centennial of President Harding's election to office of the president. So we're gonna have a conversation about what we don't know about Warren Harding, what we know about him, but kind of put him in the context of when he was our president, what our country was kind of passing through. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now and I'm gonna let Sherry share her screen and we'll start to see some images of President Harding. Sherry, I want to ask you though, um, are you a native of Marion? I am actually. I um, went other places and came back. So uh, one of those stories where you migrate back to your roots, I guess. So President Harding has been, or Warren Harding, has been part of your life all your life. To a point. Um, a lot of people even here in Marion don't know not a lot about him. They don't you know, when I was in the schools, they really didn't touch on him. I, I don't think we got any education any about him any different than anyone in Iowa or anywhere else. Um, yeah. he, he was not popular for a long, long time. And we are seeing now kind of a, a renewed interest in him across the country from scholars and authors and ordinary presidential buffs. And that kind of connects David into the conversation because David, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot or embarrassing you, but you have a wonderful tradition, I think, of going to presidential sites when you go on vacation. Yeah. So you've been here <clears throat> and you've met Sherry. Yeah, I've been a couple of times. I, I went actually in 2008, which was actually part of my honeymoon, believe it or not, which was mostly in Chicago, but also made a stop in Marion and Columbus. And, uh, and it was back in 2015, the Harding Home puts on a wonderful symposium every year. And this one was about actually First Ladies. They did it with the National First Ladies Museum, um, which is in Canton, Ohio. And um, you know, Sherry was very involved in organizing that. There were great panels all about First Ladies and the role of the office from 
Florence Harding all the way up to modern times and uh, retired chief usher of the White House spoke, Capricia Marshall spoke. So it was a really cool event and it was nice to see the Harding home. And they also did a, a replaying of the tomb that day. Oh. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of fun. Nice. Well, um, Sherry, what is happening this year at the Harding home? Because now we can talk about more than just the Harding home, we can talk about a museum as well, right? Right, we, uh, 2020, this weird 2020 is uh, the centennial of Harding's famous front porch campaign and his subsequent election to the presidency. Uh, so in building up to this year, we had always planned to restore the Harding home. That's the home that he and his wife Florence lived in for about 30 years. Um, we wanted to restore the home to how it looked during 1920, the most famous year of its existence when he was running for president. And at the same time, as if that wasn't enough to tackle, we decided to, oh, I bet about 10 years ago, to work toward building a presidential library for him. Uh, this had been, believe it or not, on the drawing board of the private organization who ran the Hart Home since 1925. They, they, and so we are completing a very old but very solid idea that this was needed. So we will be op reopening um, the entire site um, in September um, to restricted uh, visitor capacities like everybody else's and all kinds of regulations in place, uh, but we will reopen in September, Labor Day weekend. And for people who we hope our conversation today piques people's interests and sends them wanting to learn more about Warren Harding, they will be able to participate. Uh, maybe silver lining of this COVID time is you're gonna put a lot of programming online that people all over the country could take advantage of. Right, we were absolutely planning this big dedication weekend. And because um, of the COVID, we made the decision to go totally virtual with it. We didn't think that uh, we would, could gather 300 people on site and be within the, the uh, regulations here in Ohio. So this would be available for anyone to stream from our website, which is hardingpresidentialsites.org. Um, and it'll be about an hour and a half of virtual tours of the house, of the new presidential library. Um, we'll have a virtual ribbon cutting. We'll have uh, our architects talking about the design of the new building. There's lots of symbolic details that were uh, built into it. And our keynote speaker for that um, is John Dean, who also is a Harding scholar. Um, wow. He actually lived in Marion during his junior high years, a couple blocks from the site where I am now, and was a paper boy in this area. So he has quite the fondness for Warren Harding too. Um, he will give our keynote and then our Mrs. Uh, DeWine, who's the wife of our governor, Mike DeWine, will give a tribute to Florence. So we'll have lots of activities and tours and side information built into that. So that'll, that'll be free to anybody who um, wants to stop in. We'll do it on September 18th or 19th. We're not decided yet on the day, but it'll reside on the website. So if you miss it, you can, you can. Good. So something to really look forward to. But David, a hundred years ago, I kind of set the stage for um, what you want to talk about today, the campaign and then his presidency, um, what was on the minds of voters 100 years ago when he was running for the presidency? Well, I'm going um, to actually let Sherry answer that question. It, okay. Just to say, as preface, it was a very exciting time in our nation's history. It was actually the first presidential election in which women had the right to vote. And so something I'd love to hear from Sherry is sort of how Harding and his Democratic opponent, James Cox, actually um, pursued um, winning the, the, the votes of women. And also as we were coming out of World War I and 
you mentioned in the description, having dealt with a, a global uh, a global pandemic of, of flu bought back by a lot of returning service members. So there are a lot of parallels to kind of things that were going on in our country today, um, concerns about the economic health of our, our nation, and um, that Warren Harding kind of ran on this idea of trying to restore normalcy, as he called it, to try to bring a sense of calm. But let me invite Sherry to, to kind of weigh in on what was on voters' minds that year. Well, and you're right, David, there were so many parallels to what we're doing in today's world. Um, it's rather peculiar, but the Harding presidency absolutely in nearly every facet is tied to World War I and coming out of World War I. Most of his policies are tied to um, getting the country going again. A lot of it was reaction to social issues that popped up, uh, a lot of racial issues that came from that World War I experience. Um, uh, a lot of people I have found don't, don't think much went on in the early 20s. You know, we hear about the Roaring Twenties and the speakeasies and all that. They're not roaring yet. When Warren Harding is running for the presidency or when he goes to Washington in 21. And I think on people's mind is a, in 1920 is where is the country going? We're, we've come out of this war. There was no plan for transitioning to peace. It just, it just wasn't put in place by the Wilson administration. So everything just kind of stopped economically um, on Armistice Day in 1918. A lot of people lost their jobs as production lines were shut down all of a sudden. So one minute there, throwing confetti in the street, celebrating the end of the war, and the next you're handed a pink slip. Wages had gone up as they normally do during wartime. Well, now it was very common that your employer, if you kept your job, said, hey, we're going to go back to pre-war wage levels. As an employee, you're not too thrilled about that. So they are, there is labor unrest. There are a lot of strikes in the nation after World War I because of that. Unemployment in 1920 is 20%. Now to put that in perspective, during the Great Depression, it's 25%. And of course, we know the unemployment situation that we're dealing with right now across this country. So the good times are not rolling during the beginning of the Harding administration at all. Um, social issues, these are racial issues. These are, we just came through the summer of, the red summer of 1919, a lot of racial uh, unrest. Um, we've heard a lot recently about the massacre in Tulsa, which of course the white newspapers in 1921 called the race riots. It really wasn't a riot. Um, but all these things, um, so many black soldiers served in World War I, they really thought things were going to be different when they came home. And Europe, to some extent, welcomed them more. And then they came back to this country, and it's the same old thing. So that contributes to this feeling of un racial unrest in our country. Um, women, as you mentioned, women are, have fought for s decades to get the right to vote. World War I does speed up that process. You had Woodrow Wilson initially against women's suffrage. He changes his mind because he says, oh, I guess you were on the front lines in Europe. You were nurses. You did go to the factories. Rosie the Riveter from World War II really started in World War I. And so women did contribute. He could not ignore that. So he changes his tune. He's for suffrage then. So now that uh, speed of that issue is, um, is going to have an impact in that campaign of 1920. So you have all these social issues, all of these economic issues, all tangled up together with the American people saying, okay, what was the point of this war? you know, okay, fine, we won, now what? So it was evident that the United States had become a world power. Now what do we do with it? What do we do with that power? 
are we the policemen of the world? Do we lead only by example? What are we supposed to do with this? And so all of this is tangled up together. So, you know, from Warren Harding or James Cox, his opponent, they have to address a lot of these things during the campaign and whoever gets this job is going to have a very full plate. Can you um, tell Sherry a little bit about who Warren and, and by extension his wife Florence Harding were and sort of then why he was the candidate for this time in 1920 of all the issues of unrest that you just talked about? He is, is in some ways the antithesis of Woodrow Wilson, okay? Um, Wilson was so wrapped up in the League of Nations and his 14 points that a lot of Americans thought he wasn't paying attention to what was happening domestically in the country. He was traveling to Europe. At that time, presidents did not travel to other countries. And some people were offended that their president was leaving our country and going over to Europe to settle this, this peace treaty, this peace agreement. What was he doing traveling? Because they weren't used to that. Like, today when our presidents jet all over the world. That wasn't done then. And of course, he has his stroke. So he's, you know, as his presidency winds down, of course, it, it's, um, he's not seen by the public. The White House is shuttered. It's, it's a very, it's not, it's not a, a vision of activity. And it's and you know through those you know fault of his own in many ways of course with his illness, so Warren Harding is the exact opposite of Woodrow Wilson. He is saying that he wants the country to get back to normalcy. So let me let me talk about what that means because a lot of historians and authors have that wrong. He does not mean, as a lot of historians say, a return to normalcy does not mean, let's go back to how things were before the war. He's not that naive. He knows we can't do that. Nor, not only is it not possible, why would we wanna do that? There, it's not like that was a Garden of Eden where there were no problems. A return to normalcy meant go back to getting our economy going, getting our institutions in place, get the country back on its feet. Um, he always said, you know, to get, the, to get the machinery of the country running again. He doesn't mean industry. Well, he includes that, but he means get, let's, come on, let's, let's get ourselves going again. Let's all pick ourselves up. Let's move forward. People go back to your normal routines. How interesting that is with what we're going through today. That's what we all want to do with COVID, you know, get back to our normal routines. We would not think if we said we want to get back to normalcy today, we don't mean it can't be pre-COVID. It can't look the same. Right. It has to be a new normal built on some of those components, but we know it's not going to look exactly the same. Let's, it's the same parallel there. He says, you know, but let's get the Let's get the machinery going again. Let's not just sit here. That's what return to normalcy meant. And you know, we hear that all the time from, I hear Governor Cuomo and his press briefings talk about return to normalcy, a lot of media commentators. So it's interesting to see that word has, has really kind of come into our lexicon. And uh, I think it was a relatively new word in 1920 um, when Harding had well, coined it. Actually, he did not coin it. Okay. Well. <laughs> It's one of our many, many hardy myths that will roll out on a scroll. Um, it had been, it was, a, it was a perfectly legitimate word. And he actually addressed it. And he said, I don't know why, what all the hubbub is about that word. It's in my 1880 dictionary, he said. Mm. And we have that dictionary in our collections. And I looked it up and yes, it's there. Um, so in that, time period too. There was a kind of an elitist thing going on with the big cities in the east looking kind of down on those of us in the Midwest. You know, we, we must all live on farms, we're all growing corn, whatever we're doing. So it's a little elitism to say, well, he's not using that word correctly. What's, what's he saying there? 
he stuck by his word when it was called mm. his attention that some people said, no, it should be normality. And he said, hey, it's a perfectly legitimate word. I picked it. I'm using it. That's a, mm. But it's not, it was not a new word. What I would agree with is saying it was made more, um, the usage of it was put into our language mm -hmm. by him more. Because then yeah. you started seeing that word more. So he kind of gives it a, you know, a little jump start, I guess. Okay. Well, you've, you've corrected me of a myth as well, and I, I have to be more careful about that. I want to know if we could back up a little bit and just kind of give with Carolyn mentioned that Harding was a senator before he ran for president. Just a little bit of thumbnail sketch of kind of his life up until the 1920 campaign. Um, Carolyn, do you want to look? Should we look at some of the pictures? Yeah, I was going to say we should look at your, your pictures, yes. Okay. Let's see. So you... Either you can control the screen um, or I can, doesn't matter. If you've got it, you go, you, you do it. Did you know what you loaded into your slide deck? Okay. Let me, uh, just a minute here. Okay, let's get ready. Okay, so you need to give me control of your shared screen. So if you go down to the bottom of your screen, it says share screen. All right. Okay, let's let me start this. Okay, hopefully people can see that. Yes, I can see it. All right, let me change my display settings. There we go. Um, Backtrack just a minute, if, since a lot of you aren't familiar with the Harding sites, um, there's three sites in Marion, Ohio, having to do with Warren Harding. In the upper right-hand corner is the Harding home, which we have been restoring. Um, this was the site of uh, Harding's front porch campaign, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the picture at the bottom right is um, one of the the stonework over one of the windows in our new presidential library um, has the Harding monogram over it. Um, we're, we're getting our uh, landscaping done, so it doesn't look perfectly pretty yet. And then the upper left-hand corner is the Harding Memorial. That's where he and Mrs. Harding are buried. And that's about a mile and a half from the other two sites. So just to so Warren Harding is a newspaper man. He is the only journalist thus far that has been elected president. I think his record's probably intact. Um, he buys the uh, very fledgling newspaper, the Marion Daily Star in 1884. He's just 19 years old. And he buys it with two buddies, basically talks them into chipping in to buy this thing. Um, they basically bow out after a while, but he decides this is going to be his life's work. And he even says as president that he is so glad that he had been a newspaper man. He's very proud of that. Uh, this picture of him on the right shows him, uh, that's about 1910, and he's in his office at the Marion Star. Of course, there's no computer or anything on his desk. And he is on the left there. He was thought to be a very handsome man, have Roman features, whatever that meant. And his wife, Florence, whom he married in 1891. Uh, when they married, he's 25, she's 30. She's also divorced with a 10-year-old son named Marshall. She is the daughter of Marion's richest man, 
who is not thrilled that her daughter has selected Warren Harding because she made a mistake with the first husband. Dad thinks she's going to make a second mistake because Warren doesn't have much money to his name. He's not going anywhere. Um, but she, um, and he says if she marries him, she will not get any of the family money. And she says, I'll see you later. So she does marry him. So we talked about what was America like in 1920. This kind of brings us up to date. These are just some of the things um, going on, the uncertainty about America's future, uh, women pushing for voting rights, the strikes. We had, I didn't even mention the anarchy going on in the country. There were a lot of uh, judges, homes being attacked, strangely enough, by anarchists who would put pipe bombs in their mailboxes and all kinds of things. We had inflation, recession, high employment, the red summer. Oh, throw in prohibition. Let's not Maybe. forget we need something else to worry about. That goes into effect in January 1920 and debating over immigration as well. Um, so many of those things on our list today. Um, so this brings us up to 1920. This is our lineup. Um, Warren Harding has been in politics for 20 years at this point. So one of the, the misconceptions is he comes out of nowhere in 1920. Now, no one's ever heard of him. They don't even know why he's selected. That's not true. He was elected to the Ohio Senate in 1899. He served as Ohio's Lieutenant Governor after that. He ran for Ohio governor in 1910, but he lost that race. And in 1914, he was elected to Congress serving in the Senate. And that's what he was doing. He was a sitting Senator when he ran for president. So your trivia question is who, he's the first pre sitting Senator to run for, uh, to be president. We have two others that did the same thing. So you come all that over for a while. <laughs> We'll give a valuable prize at the end, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so the Republicans, he wins the Republican nomination on the 10th round of balloting. He is not a front runner going into the convention. He's known as the, one of the second tier candidates, along with Herbert Hoover, along with Calvin Coolidge, along with Hiram Johnson. Um, the front runners are Frank Loudon, governor of Illinois, and General Leonard Wood, who was one of the Rough Riders with Teddy Roosevelt, they kind of knock each other out of contention. They are, neither can get a majority of delegates and neither will cave in to the other. So they knock themselves out. Um, Warren Harding gets the nomination on the 10th ballot. Calvin Coolidge is chosen by the convention as his vice president. On the Democratic side of things, James Cox, sitting Ohio governor is chosen. And along with the up and coming Franklin D. Roosevelt. So interesting, in this election, three out of these four men make it to the White House. Only James Cox never did. And he was always, according to his autobiography, the uh, bitterness kind of comes through. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got the Ohio flag up here because our tie here between James Cox and Warren Harding is both are Ohioans. Both are also newspaper men, Cox owning the Dayton Daily News and the Miami Herald, or not the Miami Herald, Miami News, and Warren Harding, of course, the Marion Star, which also gives you uh, a little bit of insight into the importance of Ohio in the presidential landscape and the prominence of the newspaper um, field as well. So these two men, Cox and Harding, pick a very different way to campaign. Cox is going to travel from town to town by train, giving speeches wherever he can. This is a relatively new way to campaign. It's thought by many to be a little undignified. And then he has the audacity to take off his suit jacket sometimes, which is really looked down upon, and to roll up his sleeves. And so that is, that is not looked well upon. Harding decides to have a campaign in Marion, Ohio from the front porch of his house. 
So very strange idea for us today to think about. Uh, this is the fourth front porch campaign by an Ohio born president. Um, so it's clearly an Ohio thing. I can't really tell you why it is. Um, first one was James Garfield and then Benjamin Harrison. He did his from his front porch in Indianapolis, then William McKinley and then Harding. So this is gonna be the last one in our history. During the three month campaign, notice I did not say two <laughs> years, I said three months, more than 600,000 people came to this town of 28,000 to hear somebody talk from their front porch. Unbelievable kind of uh, event. That flagpole in the middle, that picture on the left is from the McKinley house in Canton, Ohio. Um, it was thought to be good luck. Of course, McKinley had been assassinated 20 years before. He was still considered a martyred president. People kind of thought, Harding and McKinley looked a little bit alike, and this would bring some good luck to the Harding campaign. And then, Trey, would people have been able to hear? Um, did they have any sound amplification? He could have. It was big clunky kinds of equipment, but he, he did not use any amplification system. Um, he did it just the old fashioned way. You just kind of talk loud and people, if you're standing in the back of the crowd, you don't really expect to catch every word. Hmm. Um, so no, he just stood on the top step and, and just talked. Um, and women are gonna play a large role uh, in this. Uh, they get uh, the last state to ratify. The 19th amendment was Tennessee on August 18th. So women are going to be a part of this 1920 election for the first time. And then election day happens on November 2nd, 1920. It's a landslide victory for Harding. He's got 404 electoral votes, the Cox is 127. There were also several other third party candidates, including socialist Eugene Debs. He came in third, Eugene did. Uh, popular vote, Harding gets 60.3%. Yeah, to Cox is 34.1. So that was the largest popular vote percentage until Lyndon Johnson, until his, his, his term where he ran on his own. So I'll bring us up to that date so far. I don't wanna dominate everything here. Sure, well I, um, I wanted to show, um, I don't know if, um, if I'm on the camera right now, or um, I, I wanted to actually show uh, an artifact that I own related to Harding's and then um, get your reaction to it, Sherry. You are um, on the camera, we can okay. see. Okay, um, can folks see, because I, 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 I can't see on my computer, can you see this? Um, I don't know how well, it's a picture of Warren and Florence Harding taken outside their DC home in Kalorama. And it's one I actually really like um, because it shows um, Florence kind of staring straight ahead at the camera, standing very serious and, and kind of very focused. And Warren is sort of looking at her with a bit of a, a grin. Um, I think this was taken around the time that he announced for president. I've seen many of these photos. It, this photo is signed, which is also very cool. But on the back is a letter. Um, it's, you're not gonna be able to read the text. That somebody who had this photograph and was very fond of the Hardings had written. And then Sherry, I'm gonna read this letter to you that was written in March of 1921. And I'm gonna ask you to kind of react to it and talk about, you know, it, if it's indicative of correspondence that they would have received at the time. Who's, the, who's, the writing, who, who's writing this, and David? Writes, I'm huh? sorry, who's writing this? Do we know? Uh, a writing? campaign supporter named Kenneth Agawa, who okay. probably owned the photo. Okay. And he just taped it on the back. And right. uh, so he writes, uh, eight days after Harding sworn into office, Mr. Warren G. Harding is a real man, having in him the combination of the best Washington, Lincoln, McKinley, and Roosevelt had in them particularly his fearing of God, his seeking of the guidance of the Almighty, his clear understanding of human nature, his justice to all, his fearless courage and his gentle heart with quiet and firm determination together with broad mind. This combination makes beyond any doubt him one of the best presidents, if not the best. Of all, he was very fortunate in having the truest, sweetest and loviest woman in heart as his life's companion, Mrs. Harding. His life's achievement and success was her to a great extent. Wow. This was a gift somebody thought knew I was a big Warren Harding fan and they said, you can't do any better than this. So wow. um, 
what was, um, how did people feel about Warren Harding? And, you know, is this indicative of people calling him the best president? They must have very high expectations for him coming into there, office. So. There were very high expectations. Um, as I said, he, he's, he was very, very different than Woodrow Wilson. He's outgoing. He's a people person um, in, in every extent. He, he, and this is where you see, I think, the newspaper man and him coming out a little bit. He, he wants to know what you think about things. If you're just an ordinary person, he looks in your eyes and he listens. And there are so many descriptions and so many letters in the Harding presidential papers from people who met him who said, I felt like I was the only one in the audience. Um, because he truly, you could tell he, he wanted to hear what I had to say. And so his personality, I, I think, you know, it sounds weird, but saying he was a sweet person is very accurate from everything I've read. Even people who disagreed with him politically, you know, they, they said, but he was one of the sweetest, nicest people mm -hmm. you could ever meet. And he, you know, I always tell people, you know, presidents have to deal with a lot of statistics and everything. And I always say, you know, he could see the people behind the statistics. Okay, so everything boiled down to him was, you know, how is this affecting um, the ordinary person out in Kansas? How, how is, you know, who's behind these unemployment statistics? Um, and, I, and I think that's what people, to a large extent, reacted to after that, you know, that feeling of insecurity coming out of wartime. And here's this guy who just really made you feel like it's going to be okay. You know, it, it's it's as basic as that. I think was the a lot of the appeal of him. And so I want to talk about the accomplishments he had as president. Um, but first, you know, since the letter especially brings up uh, Mrs. Harding and kind of the partnership they had together, can you tell us a little bit about her and sort of what they kind of how they complemented each other and how she supported him in his career? They're very different personalities. Okay, um, with Warren, he wears his heart on his sleeve. What you see is what you get. She's more complicated, in my opinion. And I spend a lot of time with these people, which, you know, it's gonna make everyone think I'm crazy, but I do spend <laughs> a lot of time with them. Um, she reminds me of kind of an onion. You have to keep peeling the layers away. Um, she, she always said that she looks in people's eyes to see if they're telling her the truth. I think a lot of that came from her failed first marriage. Uh, her, her first marriage was um, uh, Pete DeWolf, Henry DeWolf, her first uh, husband deserted her and deserted their young son. Um, just left them high and dry. Um, I don't think after that, sometimes she trusted people as much as she did before. You know, she grew up to a large extent. Um, so she looks in your eyes, see if you're telling her the truth, and then she's gonna slowly reveal parts of her to you. So you will build a relationship with her. With Warren, he will automatically accept you the way you are. Okay, so they're very different personalities. She's very strong-minded. She's very opinionated. Um, she's a great sounding board for her husband. Usually all his speeches he tries out on her first. She's not afraid to give him suggestions or tell him, no, 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 you need to change this or that. She is that person who believes utterly in his potential. And so I think she gives him uh, that inner strength to believe in himself to a large extent. Um, she, you know, she's an, an incredibly strong woman. Um, she is a terrific first lady uh, that many people don't, don't know about her. 
So as we kind of look at the Harding administration, you know, we, we had kind of identified a few areas we could go in. One, just given what's going on in current events, and you've touched on this a bit already, was in terms of race relations in this, in this country. Um, do you want to talk about kind of major uh, highlights and, and things that Harding dealt with? Very forward thinking on that subject for that time. For that time, and, and you always have to, to, I think, this is my own philosophy, you can't take people out of their time in history and put them in 2020. You know, they, they're coming from different places. He, um, and we see this even in, in some things he wrote in the, in the Marion Star. There was a, a time in Marion where um, a couple black churches, you had some young white men who were harassing them. And he publicly um, decried the whole thing and said, you know, we need to get the law to get these guys to leave these churchgoers alone. Um, you didn't see that very often um, at the time in the late 1800s, somebody, an editor doing that. Um, he really um, educated himself during the campaign. He became friends with James Weldon Johnson, one of the founders of the NAACP. He had him uh, right next door at the house. He wanted James Weldon Johnson to educate him what was on the black Americans mind. At that time, there was a lot of friction about Haiti and the United States during the Wilson administration had sent warships there. Um, he had James Weldon Johnson, let me hear it from your point of view. And they developed this correspondence all dur during Harding's presidency um, where Harding is really using him as an unofficial advisor. Um, Harding in October of 21, so he's been president for six months, um, starting in March, is invited to go to Birmingham. And he's supposed to give some pats on the back to the, to the leaders of the uh, city saying, wow, you, you know, Birmingham, let's celebrate your 50th anniversary. Birmingham's a pretty young town. Um, this is a representative of the New South after the Civil War. Civil War in, in the early 20s is still a benchmark for people. It happened 50 years ago, much like World War II used to be for a lot of us. Maybe Vietnam is for more of us. For Warren's generation, it was the Civil War. And so he goes to Birmingham and he says, you've done a terrific job, got some industry going, you're doing a great job, but there's something on my mind. And he's speaking to a segregated crowd segregated by a chain fence in what was then known as Woodrow Wilson Park. It has been renamed since then. And he says, I want to talk about the race issue in our country. Well, the whites in the crowd are astounded. What are you, what are you doing? And he says, if democracy means anything in this country, then everyone, no matter what race you are, should have the same economic, political, and educational opportunities. That seems really mild to us now to say, but back then people could not believe that he was saying that. So then you have this eruption of cheers from the black side, you have total silence from the white side. This was in the era of Jim Crow. So the object is separate but equal. Of course, they were not separate but equal schools or anything else they could not imagine at their time, black leaders or white leaders, anything about an integrated society that just wasn't on their radar. So he puts the racial issue on America's table for discussion at that time. Now, the press at the time, you know, the Southern newspapers basically said, what do you know about our problems here? Go back to Washington, You're, you know, we'll handle things ourselves." And in his speech, he said, this is not a Southern problem. Of course, you had lots of lynchings and everything. The KKK is thriving. And he, and he says, this is not just your regional problem. You can take care of any way you want to. This is a national problem. And we're gonna deal with it as a nation. So he supports, urges and supports the uh, anti-lynching bill, which dies in 
with the Southern Democrats in committee. That is raised in every presidency since then, and it never is passed. But he is supportive of that. He tries to start a racial commission, which doesn't work very well because we have arguing, well, how many whites should there be on it? How many blacks should there be on the commission? And they spend their time arguing about that instead of getting anything done. So is he a Martin Luther King or anyone? No, he's not. Hmm. But he does bring up that racial question. He is the first president to address it publicly since Reconstruction after the Civil War. So very surprising. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot recently about the uh, massacre in Tulsa in 1921. Of course, the press at the time called it, you know, a race riot, and it really was not. Harding hears about it, but he's not, he's getting a filtered report. Remember, there's no television at the time. He can't get a firsthand report, but he had been at Valley Forge um, doing a, a speech there. And he makes a detour after he hears about Tulsa and goes to Lincoln University, which is an all black college. And he makes a speech there and says, I, I, you know, I want to congratulate everyone for all their strides and all the strides you're making in education, everything. They're soothing words. He's not directly addressing Tulsa as he doesn't have the full picture of what happened, but he is offering that, he's lifting them up, okay? Mm -hmm. He's trying to say, you're doing great things and you will continue to do it. And he didn't have to do that. He changed his schedule and said, wait a minute, I wanna stop off at, at this university. So he's surprising in, in many ways like that, but he always has that ability, again, to look look at the people side of things. His predecessor segregated the federal government. That's what had, before Woodrow Wilson had been a important means for African Americans who moved to Washington to have careers, the opportunity to advance even into management positions, Woodrow Wilson tore that apart. Did Harding desegregate the federal government? He did. He did. And he did appoint some um, African Americans to post, not as many as he could, of course, um, but, um, but he did try to do that. And then um, we're, we're going to quickly run out of time um, before we get too far in this, but um, what are some of, you know, we, we had identified other areas, including economic recovery, our role in the world, and the Veterans Bureau. What, what do you think are kind of the, what, what are the other things people should know about kind of at the top of your list in terms of accomplishments during his administration? That might surprise them. Well, I think, you know, right off the bat, it's surprising that he accomplished as much as he did in a very short presidency, 29 months, and then he dies in office of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. If you've heard that Florence poisoned him, sorry, he dies of a heart attack. It's not nearly as interesting, I know, but um, he had congestive heart failure. We can we have his medical records. I mean, it's very obvious to us today. Um, he, you mentioned the the Veterans Bureau. The Veterans Bureau he authorizes, and that was to bring together uh, medical services, job retraining, kind of these. Um, reacclimation services, social services, if you will, um, for disabled veterans from the war. Um, you had all the hospitals around Washington, particularly filled with these disabled veterans, amputees, um, those blinded from the mustard gas in the trenches of Europe. We didn't know what to do with them. We had not dealt with uh, a real war since the Civil War when you hobbled home as best you could. Okay, now we have all these men coming back and we're like, oh, okay. So he authorizes the beginning of the Veterans Bureau, we know it is the VA today. So this uh, also included the building of veterans hospitals. So he starts the program for veterans that we have today. Um, I think one of his 
it's not as exciting, but it's a really significant accomplishment is starting the Bureau of the Budget, in which he well, realized- Well, in D.C., though, we all know OMB, so uh, I think a yes, lot of people will be very interested in that. That's one. right. So this is streamlining our federal government. Believe it or not, before the Harding administration, each department would give Congress, that, okay, this is how much money we need, and they had no idea where they were as an entire federal government expenses wise or they had no idea they would just vote on individual bills and he's like i've run this little newspaper in marion ohio and i can't operate like that what are you people doing so the bureau of the budget had he puts charles dawes in place and he's terrific and he goes to each to each agency and says all right what's your budget now what can we cut <laughs> so everybody hates it when charles dawes comes to your agency but they come up with a comprehensive federal uh, budget. That's what the president even today presents to Congress. This is what things look like. This is what we're gonna deal with. That's where that tradition started. And I think that's absolutely significant. Mm. Um, something I think people don't know is he was um, promoting matching funds between the federal government and states to build improved highways. It was obvious to him, he said that automobiles were here to stay and you needed a way to get from one state to the other without running into dirt roads. So the aviation industry, one of those pilots, the dog fights of World War I, you had a lot of pilots who were mostly delivering airmail after the war or crop dusting. It was obvious this was a brand new industry. So he puts in place um, plans to start building airports and by 1930 you have airports. He believes in giving uh, uh, um, Native Americans citizenship which they did not have. He starts the ball rolling on that. He dies before it's completed so Coolidge completes it. Um, he is proposing a public welfare system He's concerned about the infant mortality rate and hygiene for families and nutrition for mothers and children. Yes, this is a Republican we're talking about. Okay, he doesn't get that accomplished. Congress votes it down. Okay, so he's very forward thinking and I don't think people realize that about him. He goes to Alaska, his last trip, he is predicting statehood for Alaska. He's concerned with uh, conservation versus um, smart development of natural resources. And he doesn't get back to Washington after the trip to Alaska to start those new policies. He's really excited about what he's learned in Alaska. Doesn't get a chance to craft those policies. So a lot of things that, you know, we take for granted today had their roots, strangely enough, during the Harding administration. So, so Sherry, Harding dies in um, summer of 1923 on that trip out to the West, and you had a, a slide that had just hundreds of people, I think, at one of the funeral events kind of there mourning him. It was clear in the newspapers that he was very popular at the time of his death, but we know that as we look at him now, we have scandals that are political that come out very soon thereafter. Is it because he's not around to kind of defend himself? Why, how does he become defined by Teapot Dome and the Veterans Bureau scandal? Yeah, well, he, when he dies, he's a very popular president. This is a picture showing people in Marion, actually, that's his hearse on the road. Um, Strangely enough, traveling along the same route that they had traveled just a couple of years before during the front porch campaign. Um, his, he dies a much beloved present. The Hardy Memorial where he's buried is, is uh, all funded with private dollars and it's the largest monument to a president outside of Washington. So what happened is yes, Teapot Dome, which people have heard about but they really don't know what it is. Con Congress starts hearings uh, two months after the president dies. At the same time, there's a scandal in the Veterans Bureau in involving Charles Forbes, who had actually resigned at the beginning of 1923. Uh, Harding forced his resignation um, because there were rumors that Charles Forbes was basically, uh, had created a black market with um, 
surplus medical supplies that have been liquidated from Europe after the war. He, a big mistake Hardy made was at that time he did not call for the investigation. He just got rid of Charles Forbes, put a new director in. Um, he should have hung Charles out to dry, is what he should have done politically. Uh, Teapot Dome involved the Secretary of the Interior, um, Albert Fall, who was unanimously confirmed as Secretary of the Interior when he, um, on the Hardy administration started. He is accused of taking a $100,000 bribe to steer um, oil leasing contracts to a couple of oil friends of his. The reason that Teapot Dome, people have heard about it, is it was in the news for the rest of the 1920s. And in the end, and it was, it was drama, it was a circus, you had all kinds of strange witnesses. Um, so it was interesting. At the end, Albert Fall is found guilty of accepting a bribe, but the oil man that allegedly gave it to him is acquitted. Hmm. So it makes zero sense. But Albert Fall is the first cabinet member to go to prison. He goes for a few months. His health was broken by then. But because the president had died, and Florence Harding died in 1924, just a, the next year after her husband, you could say whatever you wanted about the Hardings. And the, of course, what are they going to do? So all the rumors start, and the gossip saying, well, if Albert Falls involved in Teapot Dome, was Harding involved? And there's never been anything, nor have I ever seen anything in the Harding presidential papers um, that remotely suggests that. Um, the Veterans Bureau scandal also did not include Harding in any stretch. They both were his guys. So yeah, if you're using the buck stops here, yeah, they were his guys. But he had no hand in either of them. But what you hear now, people say, is, oh, there were all those scandals in the Hardy administration, like there were 57 or something of them. Um, there were two. And, you know, they were his guys. Absolutely true. But, he, you know, there was no way for him to get out his side of things or anything because he, he was dead. And, and so, Sherry, I just saw a question come across the chat, and it was what I was going to kind of kind of end with. We know there were personal scandals as well, and Nan Britton, the woman he fathers a child with, and that he also has a very long affair with a neighbor of his, Carrie Phillips, and the love letters he wrote her survived because Carrie had held on to them, and they were found when she was moving into a nursing home years later. How do you kind of put those things in perspective as you evaluate Harding's character and his legacy? Well, here at the Harding Presidential Sites, we we tell you that the absolute truth as we can best know we do an incredible constant amount of research um we give you the good the bad the indifferent and it's up to our visitors to put all those facts together and come up with their own opinions we're not going to tell you what to think um they didn't do his reputation any good for sure um nan britton um that her book came out in 1927 um so that was she um was her story was that she gave birth to the president's daughter no dna back then there's no way to tell who's telling the truth or not um he's dead um and it what we said until 2015 was we don't know. We just don't know. 2015 DNA is done with a um, couple uh, Harding descendants. They are descendants of the president's brother and also Nan Britton's grandchild. And that showed that there was a very high uh, possibility that all the, the, the Harding testees were second cousins which basically says, yeah, it's true. We changed what we said the very next day here at the Harding Sites. And um, so they will be part of our presidential library and Nan's part of our exhibits. Um, Carrie Phillips, the um, woman in Marion that he did have a 10 year on again, off again affair with, she's part of our exhibits as well. Um, 
they're part of a story. They're not the entire story. Um, but yeah, they're, they're there. And because the letters, and for those who don't know, the, the Carrie Phillips letters are actually are online at the Library of Congress. They were, they were embargoed for some time as a result of an agreement um, with the Harding family and I think the, um, uh, the, the folks who had custody of the letters at the time. What did you learn from kind of reading them and what, what does that tell us? You know, it tells us a lot about kind of what was in his heart and a lot of his passion for, for this woman, but what did you kind of learn about him as a man um, and, and as a president uh, or as someone, you know, as someone just on his way to becoming president at, from reading those letters? The letters I've read a billion times, okay? And the one thing that's disappointing to people is when you go on the Library of Congress website and try to read them, they're not transcribed. So you have yeah, to read yeah, really, the script is hard. You have to read his writing. I know his writing pretty well. Um, he wrote pretty sappy poetry to her. You know, he's not a poet. Um, you know, you think of let's say emails that you might write to somebody without the thought that they're ever going to be public, you know, and, you know, I think he'd be totally humiliated if they, if he knew that those had gone public. Um, it's like a, you know, it's like a continuing conversation in those letters, you know, people wrote letters a lot back then and they'd write them over the span of a week. Say, okay, it's Tuesday night, much like a thread of emails or, or your text messages. And so he's really good at summarizing what they've been talking about. And they have arguments. I mean, Carrie is a tough customer. Um, she is a German supporter leading up to World War I. And she tries to talk him. He's, you know, when he's in the Senate, you should vote against war. And he's, no, I'm not going to do that. But he always summarizes, even though you've only got the letters from him to her, he'll say, okay, in your last letter, you took issue with me because I said this or that. So you can pick up where, what they've been talking about in most cases. Um, he gets, you know, he lays out, you know, his feelings about voting for war in World War I. He, you know, he says, no, you know, you're off base. You know, it's not me, it's you, you know. Uh, he talks about things at the Marion Star going on. They're very, you know, there's a lot of chatty letters. Um, there's a lot about common people that they know. Um, Carrie does not like Florence. That's very obvious. Um, she blames Florence for everything, which makes me feel terrible because Florence was the innocent party in all this. Um, but, you know, you get a real feel for, I think he really did love her. I think he loved Carrie. I think they would have been like oil and water if they'd ever gotten together. Um, she's Carrie's very manipulative. She likes to dangle the names of other guys she knows in front of Warren's nose, trying to make him jealous, mm -hmm. and it always works, which makes me want to, I get frustrated with him, because um, I always want to say, can't you see what she's doing? <laughs> um, you know, but I think you really just learned, that, you know, he's just a human being. He's not perfect. He's making a mistake. Yeah. Do I wish he had never gotten involved with those two women? Yes. Boy. But, you know, he's human. He made mistakes. He, you know, took chances, unnecessary chances. It is what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and wasn't Carrie's husband was, was Harding's, uh, one of his closest friends, and they, I think, worked together on a lot of civic initiatives. And well, Marianne yeah, and Jim Phillips um, owned a uh, department store downtown and the two couples, the Phillipses and the Hardings actually did socialize together um, for a long time until um, Florence had had a, an operation uh, in Columbus on her kidneys because she had chronic kidney disease. Carrie had just lost a son and so the two kind of commiserated. Mm -hmm. but what's interesting is that he, they date the exact day that their relationship starts, and it's not when they start flirting with each other, it's when they, when they consummate. And it's three years after the flirting starts, so that's kind of interesting, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, you know, this happened one night, we weren't thinking, this, this really evolved. So it, it, was, it was a love affair to some degree, but I don't think either one of them would have been happy with the other if it had actually worked out. Wow. 
And she never sold them. I mean, she had all these letters, but it was never her intention that they go public. She had kept them in the back of a closet. She could have made a lot of money. I think they had fallen on some hard times. So. Well, she also was somebody who knew that she could blackmail him with them. Did there she? Was, there was that in Perry Phillips. I mean, she threatened to go public during the campaign and the Republican Party sent Jim and her on a long trip. So, mm -hmm. you know, and this was a time too, I mean, it was, it's not right in any time in history, but, you know, men of power, that's, you know, it was, it was kind of a shrug of the shoulders uh, among a lot of, of people. Someone in um, listening wants to know if Mrs. Harding, um, did she destroy um, letters that she had or that she wrote um, just to uh, keep privacy or because um, she, she was angry or sad? She, um, she did destroy private letters. Um, she burned them after uh, her husband died. And at that time, presidential papers belonged to the spouse or the immediate heir or whatever. They did not belong to the government. And she burned private letters. But there was always a rumor um, that she burned everything, that there are no presidential papers. And there are 350,000 pages of them. So I can tell you, yeah, they exist. She burned private ones. You know, it's the same as a lot of our first ladies through history. You know, they got rid of the private letters. You know, there's very few that, you know, existed. Um, I don't know how many she, she burned. I don't get the feeling that they, you know, certainly wasn't the majority of letters by any, or papers by any stretch. But yeah, she did destroy some private letters. Yeah. Yeah. Another person listening has identified another spot. We've got an East Coast spot Warren Harding in RDC Calorama neighborhood, the house, which today is lived in by the ambassador to Monaco. It's on Wyoming Drive, uh, Northwest. Yeah. And then of course you are ground zero in Miriam, but then someone is sharing that the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, which is where he was when he died, Yes, on the eighth floor in the presidential suite. Right, so that's still standing. Right. And you could go pay tribute to him there. And while you're there, um, Maxfield Parrish, he had uh, commissioned a 1909, 1909 painting, The Pied Piper, that still you can see in the hotel bar. And so President Harding would have seen that mural as well when he visited there. Yeah, the Palace Hotel I've, I've talked to, we do a lot of public programming here. I've talked to them a lot about um, anything they have out there. So um, yeah, it's, uh, there, are, there are a lot of places all over the country, you know, of course, tons in Washington that he would have had his fingers on, you know, like the Lincoln Memorial and the yeah, Tomb of the yeah. Unknown Soldier. And, uh, right. you know, it's fascinating. Right. Well, we're kind of run out of time, but David and Sherry, last things you want us to know about Warren Harding? Well, I'd love to ask Sherry, what are some great books for people who want to know more about Hart, about the uh, Hardings? Well, I'll tell you, there's more poorly written books than good books, okay? So um, over the years, I mean, there were just some real doozies. I've got them all, I've read them all. Um, the ones I usually recommend to people, um, are the ones are ones we sell in our gift shop actually because um, and anyway, one is um, uh, Warren G Harding by John Dean. It's part of the Arthur Schlesinger series of books, um, and he wrote that in 2002. It's it's a real quick read, so if you're just trying to get a feel for the story, that's <laughs> one that we sell a lot of. Um, the really the the Bible of the Harding presidency. You can see all my marks and everything in here. This is the Harding era by Robert K. Murray. And this is, I mean, it's everything you wanted to know about the Harding administration. So a little more, a lot more in depth than the Dean book. Um, and then I'm going to plug my own book. Because, <laughs> I was hoping you would. Well, um, it's Warren G. Harding and the Marion Daily Star, How Newspapering Shaped a President. I don't have one sitting on my messy desk right now, but 
um, you know, I kind of tracked that newspaper man in him and how it affected uh, his, his thinking um, and how he attacked the presidency, since he probably will be the only journalist we'll have in the White House. Um, but, and then uh, Katie Sibley wrote a book about Florence. Um, it's pretty decent. Um, so we carry that book as well. Um, but, you know, we're just starting to see a lot of resurgence and in interest in Warren G. Hardy about the last 15 years or so. Um, Jim Robinaut wrote the book about the Harding Affair. That was the Carrie Phillips um, thing. It's not in print anymore, but I still think you can get it on um, as an ebook. Mm -hmm. He told me. Um, he he floats the theory that Carrie was a German spy. I, I don't go quite that far. I don't think I think Carrie talked too much to be a spy, but that's just you know. But it's fun to debate. Um, well, and the other nice thing about Robinault's book is that he had access to all the letters before they were public, so you don't have to read Harding's script. He quotes from many of them, and he so does. it's a way to yeah, really he, get a sense of the correspondence. Yeah. And, and he puts it in perspective of the times in which the letter was written, what was going on in yes. mother research. Yes. Um, well, thank you. We, we got to... Okay. We, I mean, I, we didn't even get to Lincoln Memorial. We didn't get to Tomb of the End. I mean, this clearly there's more to this president than we assume and that we're told. So Sherry, heartfelt thanks for you, oh. your willingness to participate today. Thank I'm so you. happy that there's now a whole flock of people in the DC metro area and beyond who know to start looking at the website for your site in Miriam come September so they can participate in what you'll be doing there and that we have all these reading recommendations. And David, we wouldn't be doing this without your intrepid vacation travels to presidential <laughs> site and you and I having the conversations we've had about your yeah. Yeah. enthusiasm from Warren Harding. So thank you very much. It was a great program. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank, thank you, you Sherry. And we hope next week for those of you who can come back, um, we're going to stay in this time period, but we're going to stick to our focus back in Washington, D.C. and talk about what happened here in the red summer of 1919. I am hoping to be joined by two historians, Christopher Ash and Derek Musgrove, who wrote this um, invaluable book a couple years ago called Chocolate City, Race and Democracy in America's Capital City. And they're gonna talk about the chapter in their book all about the race riot that occurred in Washington in 1919. Come back for that. Get an email on Monday with a link to that program. Sherry and David, thank you again. Thank you much. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.